morning, morning. morning. How are you doing? Great. Great. Okay. Okay. On behalf of RT Delhi, I welcome you all on campus formally. And today we are going to have a very interesting session by Professor Ekhita, who is with us. You might have seen so many posters outside. She is born and raised in Pakistan and specializes in business cycles development. Her research has been focused on the Pakistan and 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 Pakistan Years at Delhi, she teaches at the Department of Management Studies, and here we are going to listen from her about industrialization. My welcome to everyone. So industrialization and much more. So looking forward to her session. I'm sure all of you are also looking forward to her session. Yes. yes. Okay. And next up, just let me announce. Next up, the next speaker series that we have is on 25th of March. That's by Professor Ajit, and there will be his co-instructor. He is from the Department of Physics, Specialization, Applied Economics, Applied Mechanics. Sorry, Applied Mechanics. Okay, so that's the next session. So please give her a round of applause. And Over to you, Manu. Thank you, Professor Vishwajita. And good morning to all of you. Good morning. So nice to see you all. Um, this is my very first time uh, to have a talk with you youngsters in India. So if my accent is not clear, if my content is not clear, please feel free to intervene. I'm happy to clarify whenever it is needed. So don't feel that uh, hesitant. That's a fun thing. Um, okay, I'm going to speak politically Hindi. <laughs> so, Namaste. Namaste. My name is Eli Kun. I'm going to speak Japan. So, I'm going to speak about economic science and technology. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand? So, I'm learning Hindi. So you are a student, you are learning a lot of subjects, I am also learning Hindi. So learning never stops. Right? Yes, so, that is a very important thing we need to keep going. So yeah, I'm just trying this. Now that I am um, also learning Hindi, I also want you to learn some Japanese, you know, to take away. Um, that is sense konnichiwa. So most of the content I present, I took it from internet, and then I I didn't mention many sources, but just a disclaimer to make. So one thing you can say the master is konnichiwa. Have you heard about this word? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, no, I <laughs> for the explanation. But you know, I find it very important to learn language. You know, understand other culture, how people behave. You know, understand the food, you know, these comes with the language. So for me, learning language is very important and I hope you can also pick up a few words. I think you will watch anime and yeah, it's easier for you. So your Japanese probably more advanced than my Hindi. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Right. I just want to also start with the one slide. You know, Japan and India has been having a long, long term relationship, if you know. So, um, that one picture you see is called Benzai Ten. Benzai Ten. It's the name of the god in Japan. And um, the root is from India. Do you know which Indian god? Yes, Saraswati and Lakshmi. Lakshmi. Yeah. Or sort of like combined. So the Buddhism came from India, right? And then going through China, and then we have this. God, Benzai Ten in Japan. So the, the history started with a lot of interactions in the cultural side. And then a lot of development happened. And then now we have more cross ties, diplomatic and also economic ties. You know what it, this is? Metro. Delhi Metro. Some of you have taken today, right? So that uh, Japan has been supporting India to develop the Metro for 20 years now or more. 
So like a lot of uh, Japan's been seen in India, and then we also more and more have uh, Indians coming into Japan. So the ties are strengthening, but still slowly. So I hope today's session will also give you some idea and to get more interested in Japan as well, right? The, the reason why I'm here is to make a bridge between Japan and India. Right? We also have a Professor Azuma, he's also Japanese. He's in the physics department. So we are having you know, much more presence, slowly, slowly grow. So that is the background of it. But of course, today's topic, we need to talk about economics, science, and technology. So I want to discuss four questions broadly. I probably am going to speak about one hour. If I'm over time, please let me know. Yeah? So I want to start with having everyone on the same page. What is economics? How many of you have been doing economics? No, it, you will do the economics? Oh, okay. So economics is pretty much a new subject for you all. Yes. You are going to the science stream. Okay. So I'm glad that I can give you a bit of flavor about economics and then try to make a linkages between science and economics. So let me just start with what is economics. It's a basic stuff. No? I'm going to start. Then I want to focus on the gross, gross, economic gross. Have you heard about this term? Yeah. So we talk a lot about economic gross. And this is a very important concept, one of the very important concepts in economics. So I want to pick up this and then discuss something like why China is growing, why US is growing, why India is not Japan, why India is not China. So these questions can be addressed here. And after that, do we see the economy growing always in a stable manner? We recently had COVID crisis, isn't it? We had the lockdown, economic activity collapse, right? Is it happening very regularly or this is just a random event? How we perceive the economy is a very important. So I also want to touch upon that. Then, of course, we need to talk about the future. You're the future of India, future of the world. So I also want to touch upon how I perceive how the future economy is going to be. Okay? So that is the agenda today I'm having. And of course, for me, you know, it would be. I'll be very happy if you can see this economics as a one of the stream, But you, you have a lot of career projection relocated to if you go to the science. But economics touches upon very important aspect. Talking about you and me, right? It's about the society, right? How you contribute to the society in the future as well. So I hope this sort of widen a bit of horizon for you to see. You know, have informed uh, choices. As well. So that's the, the background of it. So let's me get in, into that. So, what is economics? Right? So, the economics is the study of the economy. It's very simple. But, so what is the economy? That is a question you may be have. The definition, right? Definition is an integrated system of production, distribution, and consumption. Right? So, still, what it is about. So, I made this. You know Shinchan, huh? Yes. <laughs> so you, you think Shinchan is you, okay? So you are going to go to Kirana store nearby, right? So you, you go and buy what? Normally some snacks, juice, whatever you're going to do. So Shinchan is going to oh you don't go? <laughs> Shinchan is going to go to Kirana store buy Coca-Cola, suppose. Okay? So Shinchan gets Coca-Cola, right? And then Shinchan will pay money. Okay. This is the transaction, this is the, what we do, we call it as consumption, consumption. Okay. You consume something, you consume Coca-Cola, okay. so this is a consumption. But to consume something, we need to have that product be in Kirana store, isn't it? So someone needs to produce Coca-Cola, isn't it? Yes. So the factory makes a Coca-Cola, right? But Coca-Cola being made in the factory, so this we call it as a production, production. This doesn't directly go to Shenzhen, isn't it? Someone needs to distribute, isn't it? So here the transportation companies and distribution company comes, 
So the Toka Pola will be distributed to the individual shop. See, you see the integration. Of course, whatever you you get, all the money is been also sent back to production, so the factories and the entrepreneurs, whoever you call it, farms and also the distributors, right? So the, all the money transactions been involving and another is circulating, okay? But think about it, where is Shinjin gets money? He is a child. You you also need to get money from someone. Yes. Yes. Who do you get money from? Yes. Parents, right? Where do your parents get money? Oh. They're working, isn't it? So suppose Shinjin's parents are working in the factory. Then they get wages, wages, salaries, right? Every month. And that is now going to Xinjiang. Right? So again, the connection is also being made here. All right. Okay. So this is the basic things what we are now looking at. And then think about it. Is Coca-Cola price the same as five years back? No. no. So the price level has increased. This we call it as Inflation. Great. You, you call it as inflation. Used to be, India did not have a factory in India to produce Coca Cola. So, India was getting this Coca Cola from outside of the country. How do we call it? It's an import. Right? So, then, and then India also exports a lot of products, isn't it? So, this relationship of import and output, out, uh, sorry, export, we call it as trade. Trade, right? So, when we talk about economics, sorry, I'm just going to do it previously. Okay, we are talking about two things. One is a microeconomics. Micro is a relationship between farms and individuals. Okay. But when we talk about macro, we include all the relationship beyond individual farms and then uh, uh, individuals and farmers' activity, but also the global system, right? The trade, inflation, growth. These are all integrated matters. So when we talk about economics, you have to talk about the micro and macro, it's all interlinked, okay? Now, can this activity of you doing or farms are doing be independent? No, it's always interlinked, isn't it? And you are not existing alone. Right? You have a relationship with parents, your relationship with the storekeepers, your reading, your product is coming from somewhere else. And then what happens in the rest of the world also impacts you. Why inflation is happening now? Russia, Ukraine, conflict. You're following the news? Yes. Yes. Energy prices rising. So that is also impacting on the production cost. Something you need to produce, you need the inputs, isn't it? That's science, right? To produce something, you need inputs. So input cost is rising. That's why you have to pay more money because cost is very, very high. Yeah. So it's all in interlinked things. You can't sort of exist independently. Everything's internet and the behavior, how it works. This is the social science we are trying to understand. Right? So the social science, science are present in the system, you know. So that's what we are trying to look into. Are you with me? Yes. yes. Any questions? Yeah. No? You're clear. Yeah. Okay, very good. So let me move on. Okay. When we look at the gross size of the economy, we use the, the measurement for the GDP. Gross development, uh, sorry. Domestic product. Exactly. <laughs> you know that GDP, right? Gross domestic product at the constant price. When we do the comparison, we use the current price, but it's an nitty gritty. I'm not getting into it. But this is the figure that I've took, taken from the internet showing which country has a, which size of the economy, right? So, invariably, which country has the biggest size? United States. Followed by China. China. Which one is the third one? Japan. Japan. Japan and India is? Fourth, fourth. Germany. Uh, fourth. Germany. Germany. India is six at this six. moment. But soon to taking over Germany and Japan and other things. So why do we need to talk about the growth? What why this this matters? Has anyone thought about it? 
Just because China is big, just because Japan is big, so what? Has anyone thought about it? We need to have production, that is a fundamental thing, so I'll come back to that. But that links with the living standard, living standard. You know, if we have a higher gross, bigger gross, more people coming out of poverty, our living standard will improve, isn't it? Look at the US, look at Japan, look at France, look at Germany. These are so-called advanced developed economies, right? They are having much higher living standard, isn't it? And India is also on the way to catch up, isn't it? So here, of course, if you look at it, very fascinating. This is the GDP in the time series, isn't it? from 1960 to uh, 2020. That you see the selected country economy growth, how it is moving, right? So that China is a very interesting one. That orange line, orange line. Can you see? Yes, China's uh, GDP size is very very small. It's near zero, isn't it? Long long time. But it has taken off from somewhere here and rising very sharply. Right? This is fascinating growth, and then now China will catch up. US. The US, US. And why? Like they said, it's a production. They're, they're having a huge production. I'll come back to that. This is the, the facts, right? As China grows, the poverty rate is falling. Poverty rate is falling, right? Basically, as you grow, you have much, much more activity happening in the economy. You see that the relationship, right? You, move, you consume more. You produce more, right? you distribute more. So the size will big, become bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? That contributes to more people. If we have more production, there is more jobs. Right? Your parents will get job much easily when you become, you finish your school, when you look for a job, right? you have more opportunity to, to choose. Right? And your income will also rise. Right? That's also one way to. Look up. So, importance is the rise of the living standard. That, that's why I'm talking about the growth. The question is why some countries grow much more than other economies, right? Why India is not growing as much as Japan and other economies, right? Does anyone know about the Japanese economy? No? No clue? Uh, the workforce is falling down because of uh, fertility rate. So, can you speak a bit louder? The workforce is falling down because of the fertility rate. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. Our population is aging. Yeah, that is one big issue. That's why we want to have more people from abroad to help Japanese to take care of people. You know, the, so the care sector is one big, big one that is happening. Any other? No? Just just people getting into answering the thing. So do you know what this picture is? Mount it's a Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji. It's a high highest mm -hmm. mountain in Japan. And the cherry blossom is coming next month. There's beautiful, beautiful seasons. So if you have ch chance to come to Japan, you know there's an opportunity to go to Japan, a Sakura program, exchange program. That is uh, helping you to go to Japan if you've been selected. Right? So you can also look for some opportunities, the government funded program as well. So those you might be interested in that. Sorry, I'm a bit advertising it here as well. <laughs> but here's the thing. How Japan grew. Now Japan is number three in the economy. Right? And then to understand that we need to go back to the history. You need to go back to the history. Do you learn history in class? Yeah. So we also need to go back to the Japanese history. You know, you know the samurai people. Yes. yes. And yes. And, right? So at one point, Japan needs to abandon that system. When the period called Meiji came in, Meiji came. In. That's a period started in 1868. Used to be the shogunate. Shogunate Tokugawa, who was the top of the system, but he gave up on his position. Okay, let us modernize. Okay, why we needed to modernize that time? One is the external pressure. 
Japan used to be closed society. We call it the Sakoku, closed Japan. Only few countries managed to trade with Japan. Right? But that time, US came, UK came, put the pressure on Japan, you have to open up. So the external pressure is one way. The other one is, of course, the domestic turmoil. Right? Internal drama, political turmoil has led to take a decision that we need to now shift the system, you know. Then we call it as a Meiji Restoration Land period. And what happened in Japan is that the government <coughs> decided to modernize Japan. We need to promote the industry. Industry. We need to have an industrialization. That is what the Japan's growth has started. This is the, the picture I took again from the internet. You know, you see the people wearing the traditional dresses, you know, has been now adapting to the Western style, you know, dresses and the lifestyles and all that. We wanted to catch up with the West. Right? What are the, those Western countries? Of course, UK, US, you know, those European so-called Western economies we wanted to catch up. So what the government did is, okay, to promote the industry, we need to basically westernize. The way we think, the way we see, needs to be changed. Complete mindset needs to be changed. And we also focus on the export of the goods. The, the change is not the domestic economy, but we started to focus on the external market. And we started with the textile industry. It sounds familiar to you as well, isn't it? Indian economy also flourished well. The textile. So a bit of mirroring is also you can observe probably. But what happened is that basically Japan had a very good um, silk making, silk making. So that is in the middle of the picture, showing the mechanized factory. It's called Tommy Oka uh, to the silk making factory. That is now the World Heritage as well. That's where they have scaled it up the massive production of the, the textile, right? Here, you do the hundreds. Ganhiji also did this, no? But now, mechanizing in the massive scale to produce, which means that economic impact is huge. One type of economic impact, you press the button, machines will make in a huge scale, right? The scale will also reduce the cost. Economies of scale, we call it. What China is doing, China produced massively, right? then price is much cheaper, isn't it? So the same thing, mechanization does, isn't it? But at the same time, to run this, you need a lot of electricity and all sorts of things, right? So the Japan is a lot of coal to burn, right? Started with the textile. Then now shifting to the heavy industries, eh? the steel and shipbuildings, coal mining, right? these heavy industries also came up. Right? And but the issue was, you know, the West was already advanced than Japan. Japan is catching up, industrializing. So they already have had not the cotton, but they had already synthetic fiber. Here you're interested in textile probably, you can, you know, study those materials, that now it's a polymer and all that is coming, right? So they already have been ahead from cotton to synthetic fiber. Synthetic fiber and all that will be made in the factories, isn't it? And then the per unit cost and was much, much smaller. I checked it the relative to the making of wool. Ooh, Europe is very poor, no? so they, they use wool, right? Relative to that, uh, so the wool has 12 times more cost in making relative to this synthetic fiber. So then Japan's catching up with silk and cotton is already behind. They are already ahead with new technology to have come in already. So a lot of catching up is to continue. Education is also very important factors. You are now learning. Right? Education is a basic quality that we all need. Japan was forcing everyone to go to school, read and write 100%. Right? So the education, access to the education, quality of education 
is something like that very important. So that the government policy, a government decided to have a strong industry, private sector also tried to start come in. We individual have capability to operate these machines, right? Read and write, and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so far. Thank you. Yeah, so this is how the industrialization started. Now, a bit of question. And so you see what is that? Yeah. This is for the textile, no? looming, looming machine. Eh? So we're, I'm still talking about that the thing. No? So which company do you think this company, uh, the, you know, this person has started? I, you can see that, no? <laughs> Toyota, you know, Toyota, no? Toyota is uh, one of the biggest company in the world, and they are producing vehicles. Eh? But they started their businesses with textile. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. He, his name is Sakichi Toyota. Sakichi Toyota. Okay? He started. He was a basically inventor, and he started this very fast. Um, the um, power room, right? So that the mechanization started. Mechanical engineering, right? We can do that. Then he established this spinning company and his son has started this Toyota company. Right? Basically, what happened is that his son went to the, the Europe and the US to see the cars running. Right? And then he also tries to learn what is the mechanism are. He himself also the entrepreneur and then the inventor. So his father also, of course, helps to finance, right? To have something, you need money, you need technology, you need capacity, capability, right? So basically, his father you know, helped him to finance it as well. But technology, of course, he himself tried to endogenize. He himself is an inventor. But he also needs to learn from foreigners. Right? So the Japan, when we implemented this, we got a lot of technology uh, support from the foreign scientists. Scientists. With this, we call it as technology. Transfer technology transfer. India also tries to do a lot of endogenizing, you know, the, the jugaad, right? You have a lot of that, but that is still tries to patch here and there and very quick things. Huh? But you also want to have structured, more sophisticated technology. What do you do? You collaborate with foreign counterparts, isn't it? So Japan also did the same thing. So Japan invited a lot of foreign uh, scientists and under the government, and then they basically dispatched everywhere to improve the agricultural productivity, you know, to industrialize, all the techniques, all the knowledges also came from abroad. You see a lot of mirroring happening with India, right? So we can learn from the history. That is very, very important things to do. But one is underlying, so the, the science basically comes in to structure the understanding. So we see certain phenomena, we need to understand in the structure framework, in the framework. So this is one, one thing you can see, the industrialization. So the industrialization has happened actually in the West, the UK. You, you know about it probably, right? So it was a industry 1.0. Right? So what is it written is basically mechanizing, right? mechanizing. It's a lot of uh, um, mechanization uh, happens. So new manufacturing process, new manufacturing process has came in. So the chemical manufacturing to iron production and the very revolutionary ones is use of water and steam power. That was a very, very uh, fascinating one. Right? And after that, industry 2.0. Right? It's, it's another type of industrial production. Once you have something, you now need to scale it up. Scale it up. Right? And then it became mass production. Production can happen at a massive scale now. Okay? And then massive scale, it is happening. And a lot of electricity use also increased. That's where coal and then other fossil fuel use also came in a lot at that time. 
Yeah, that is one picture I've taken uh, from the internet on the UK. UK, right? So they're still using the hands to produce something, but you can see a bit of the machines at the back side, isn't it? So it started with the UK, but it was taken over by the US at a certain point. Do you know when it has happened? Okay. It happened in the 1930s, most likely, when the Great Depression, the US has suffered a huge economic downturn at that time, 1930s, 1930s, 1930s. The US has taken over UK at that time, but a lot of changes comes with the technological innovations. A lot of innovation comes with it. And some example I just put it. Can anyone identify what are those? Fridge. Fridge is very much of the innovation in the 1920s. Every household has has this uh, fridge. What can you do? Before you couldn't store the food before, but now you can store food long time. You don't need to go very frequently to the shops. It's liberationalizing your behavior, isn't it? If you have a fridge at home, then that's you can spend that time to do some other activities. Okay? So these are also the revolutionary things. We take it for granted, right? But these are the very important things. Any other things? This is a form, Grand Bell, right? Used to be the very big fonts and black colors when you only have now mobile phone tiny things. So it started with these and then it has a technological advancement to make it smaller with more capacity, more connectivity, right? Without phone, can you live? No. Yeah. <laughs> but someone has invented this, right? And someone has modified it in the process, you see, right? That one, penicillin, penicillin, right? That also revolutionized your medical history, isn't it? That antibiotic, basically. India, very important, isn't it? You have big pharma industry, yes. right? You, you guys are making generic, but now you're going to be probably wanting to have build your own medicine to sell to the rest of the world, isn't it? So the, there's a lot of uh, innovation happens in across the industrial Pump, not only for mechanical side, right? So everywhere you can. So this is just examples. So if you go and have a look, it's fascinating, right? Whatever, pretty much the benefit is someone has invented. Yeah? So that's that's some examples to show. Another example. Do you know this? Walkman. Has anyone heard about the Walkman? You know Sony. Yes. 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 You know Sony. Sony is one of also the biggest company in Japan, right? A lot of time away, but the Japan has, you know, big companies now. Walkman. It was a very, very innovative thing. You can listen to music while you're walking. You have a cassette tape. Have you seen the cassette tape? Yes. 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 Huh. So you can put the cassette tape in there. Right? But now, I think I skipped CDs. You know CDs? Yes. The donut size. Huh? That also Walkman has that. And now it became iPod. You have iPod? No. I guess you don't need, no? Now you have streaming services with your phone, yeah. all right? So the, you can tell me which generation, maybe your, your parents is different generation. But see, the technology changes over the years, right? And what can you do also changes, right? This also links with the industrial development, isn't it? Right? What you can do is stream without the internet. You couldn't have done it before. Who has invented the internet? It's also the military-linked technology, right? Military technology has been used for commercialized purposes as well. And so the as we have a technological advancement, also the corporations benefit, isn't it? They make a lot of money out of it. Right? To keep producing, you need money to sustain their businesses, right? They need to sell more. Goods. You need a scale to do that, right? So that for the corporations to keep selling, no one wants Walkman now. We have alternative, right? Yes. So the one Sony needs to do. So Sony. Sony is going away. Exactly. So that's what it needed, right? So the Sony also needs to follow some other technology. But if if they also join the Streaming, what's going to happen to Sony? Because there's a lot of competitions, right? So they need to innovate much, much more, right? When the sciences, okay, 
come in. And you see the linkages as well? Yes, sir. Yeah? All right. So this is just a summary, you know, what we see is very interesting in the long, long history. I want to go back to the history again. What we see is the economy goes up and down, up and down. Yes. And if we see the linkages, you know, it moves with like 40 to 70 years cycle. And it links with the technology. Whatever technology comes in, that moves the world in the different directions. Right? We had a canals been invented. You know canals, right? Yes. Yeah, canals been invented. Railway system is also invented, right? Steel combustion engines and all that. Now where we are is Is there anything I'm missing? You you was a front runner of the future. But now we are pretty much being connected and now we into the AI. Yes. And the others, right? That is also driving another round of innovation, isn't it? Right? And then also, if you look at it, hegemonic power means which country will lead the global economy? Lead the global economy. See, UK has been leading the global economy before because they had industrial revolution. They were very early stage. They picked up industrial revolution. The US comes in. Afterwards, US took over. Now you see the US and China, right? But it, it was not US, it was the UK before, right? Then US took over, right? Then now China and East Asia are coming, right? And you want to join in this bandwagon or to, to lead in the future, isn't it? So the power, global power, also links with the size of the economy. Right? And then what do you produce? And it's linking with the industrial development. That is a fundamental thing. And this is also a very interesting chart I saw. You know, the finance ministry produces two documents in February, and one day before the February pass. You, you must have been hearing a lot about the budget. Yes. Yes. Budget, isn't it? One day before the finance ministry also announced economic survey. Economic survey. It's a very big document, but that booklet will help you to understand where the economy is. But anyway, don't worry about it. But one of the charts I've taken it, I think this was like two, three years back they have put in, is that how much is the size of the economy in terms of the shares? They selected a few countries and then plotted, right? Look at India, where is it India? India is used to be the power, the power. In this share, see the beginning of the history, yeah. India assumed the largest share of the global GDP, right? But it has been shrinking over the year, over the year. Alternatively, which country came bigger? US. Yeah, US and UK also. U UK size is relatively small, but these are expanding, isn't it? But at certain point, it peaked, and then started to have a reversal in the U.S. But hoping India to become the bigger, and which other countries are be becoming bigger? China. China is becoming bigger. Japan also trying to reduce, right? Japan also catch up a bit later, isn't it? Japan was also late comers. So what is happening is that. We see the structural change, we call it. The system economy changes over the years. Structure of the economy changes. This is the manifestation of the structural, structural shift in the global economy. Right? What is um, happening for India? Do you know why India's share became very small? Indeed, it was a colonialism that the UK has destroyed the Indian industry, economy. Right? That time India has a huge textile industry, right? but it's been completely destroyed by the UK. They also had a trade policy to put a lot of tariffs and the cost to export. Right? So India became underdeveloped because of the colonial history. But what you see now, is a lot of attempt to see make in India. Isn't it? India tries to re-industrialize to catch up. You see the history to grow much stronger. What do you need? 
Industrialization, isn't it? To industrialize, what do you need? You need technology to, to make production capacity. So many companies are not coming, you know? Huge factories been opened. Now recently, Apple has come in. Like yeah. Samsung's also been, uh, any other company you know? Hmm? Everywhere you see, the many, many uh, companies are coming in to start a large factory. Right? Why so? Why so? India is big market. Cheap labor. Electric supply is a bit still not so stable. Hmm? Like, isn't it too hot? Both quarters, you see, Okay, suited so for the, we call it endowment. Whatever we get, right? It is not. Cheap resources. Cheap resources. What you say, Ashwin? Sorry, I can't hear you. No. The same thing. Raw material. Raw material. Raw materials. Not the critical mineral for, like, let's say, um, semiconductor and all that. Some critical ones are not exactly there, but. Some raw materials materials are available in them. What about the lithium sources which are hmm? used recently? Sorry, I can't hear you. Then what about the lithium resources which are Ah you discovered it as well, you know? Right. And I think Odisha is the one that is having a lot of mining and all that, right? So it is also trying to come up with the input from own country, but like Japan doesn't have any resources. Right? So then these countries continues to depend on the imports. And what happens is that India is depending a lot of imports from China. China. So India is trying to be away from China, but it's very difficult. So economic ties, very strong. But, but you know what is happening, right? The aim is to be self-sufficient. Why self-sufficiency is very important? To be independent. Right. So not being influenced by others. You, you have your autonomy to decide. But what is India is needed is more technology, right? Yeah. More R and D. Research and development is happening at the university now. Corporates also spend a lot of money, but it's just the starting, right? So you have a lot of collaborations with foreign. Uh, counterparts to have technology, finance, where the finance is coming from, where the money is coming from. Finance, uh, finance. Yeah, you need to export more, but <coughs> export size is still very, very small. So India needs to ramp up the export. And that's the East Asian countries, Japan, why we have much more stronger growth is because the market outside is much bigger. India is saying that you have domestic market that is huge, but relative to the global, right? The global, uh, I think in terms of the population as well, it's a double or triple the size, no? Of the market. So India needs to export more to be able to finance without any issue. So India depends a lot on the foreign aid, foreign aid or some financial assistance as well. But as the private sector participation grows, then you attract more foreign investment as well. Right? So then India is now growing, so it's becoming much, much more better cycle than uh, uh, being seen. Right? Virtuous cycle has been seen at this moment. Huh. Now, the third question Am I on time? No, we can take 15 more minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'll just skip very quickly, but what happens is that economy doesn't move in straight lines, right? When we see the recent crisis, we, see, we saw the recent crisis, right? Everything plus. Do you know when that happened in the last time? Yeah, 2007 to 9 period, US had the housing bubble crisis that affected the global economy. Do you know one before? When did that happen? That is 2012-13. Uh, yeah, that's uh, after the 2007-9 crisis. Before was dot-com bubble, 2001, US IT sector. 
yeah. and bubble, yeah. the big pool, and so when we see the economy periodically collapse, okay, that happens. So there are different types of cycle, again, you know, trying to classify, but what we see is that the long cycle we saw that, and that is interacting with 7 to 11 years, we experience the cycle. It's a fascinating, you just count the numbers of the years. 2009, 2020, how many years? And 2001 to 2007, sorry, 2001 to 2008, seven years. Before 1991 to 2001, it's fascinating, isn't it? So there is some tendencies are observed. This is structural framework, isn't it? And we can understand when the next crisis is coming. Of course, maybe we are having crisis this year. It's a double dip, double dip, because the recovery from the COVID is very, very weak, isn't it? But if this law operates in this capitalist system where we are living in, we are living in a capitalist system, right? Profit is a fundamental driver. If that is the case, we will see another crisis within 7 to 11 years. That matters a lot, isn't it? You can forecast the future. It's not exactly, so nitty gritty needs to come. Here you can do the math, you, you forecast, it, it doesn't work. Because this is societal relationship, economic relationship, you have to analyze. But you can actually see the framework of the analysis that certain period of the time you will see certain economic movement being happening. But maybe it's too too much, so I'm just going to leave it. Do you know who he is? <laughs> so this is the, uh, his, uh, one of the, um, what's that, Instagram posts during the COVID period, what he says. This pretty much for me is a fascinating statement that he made. What he's saying, sorry, you can also read it, but in a nutshell what he's saying, that in the crisis period, we need to innovate and adapt. Crisis is a moment that we are forced to adapt to changes, isn't it? If we know 7 to 11 years, the crisis is coming, our change needs to be constant. Always we need to be innovating, we need to be changing. It's not only for the technology, you yourself have to change, isn't it? I always say, okay, 10 years back, right? But I now have to adjust to how you guys create the future, isn't it? So that for everyone, the changes need to come. And this is a fundamental business is doing, is keep innovating. That's what is happening. So what is the future? In future, what I'm saying that this is the forecast in 2030s, India becomes number two in the world. Where's the so called advanced economies? US becomes number three, Japan becomes number nine, okay? then Germany is number 10. And those are the new countries who are emerging Turkey, Indonesia, Brazil, Turkey. Russia may, may not be, I don't know, but see, the changes is going to be come, right? Developing nations will grow much faster, much bigger, because you have vibrant population, right? You have more space to grow, more to build a road, airport, you know, a lot of spaces to grow, right? And you are having much, much more uh, attraction for the investment. Right? We need to have more investment. Then, India will change the world. Do you think this is the case? Yes. You guys are the agent to do this, no? <laughs> you have confidence or not no confidence? You can do it. Right? But what can you do? It's just ambition per se doesn't help, no? Why you want to do the science? Can you contribute to this growth? Can you contribute to the, to the economic growth of the country? Our living standards to rise. Okay. Now that's what you need to think. What you, why are you choosing this stream in the subject choice you're going to make? The thinking long term. And what can you do for India? That's something. But now, so this is a bit like industrial revolution, isn't it? So that we used to have this uh, coexistence of the nature, you know, we were pretty much, you know, on the field, 
but we have developed from, from that side to agrarian society, right? India has a lot of agrarian, you know, sector, huge sectors remaining, but it's shrinking slowly, slowly, isn't it? The service sector is growing, the manufacturing is also trying to grow, right? So the structural shift is also happening. Then, of course, we have industrialization, industrial strata. society now pretty much asking you all to do this, digitalization, digitalization. Now we move to the society 5.0. I don't know whether I can adopt it, but it's pretty much you're marrying with the technology, isn't it? I don't, I don't know whether technology is leading, uh, leading us or we leading technology. It's a lot of virtual things going on. No? You probably play a lot of games and then that must be very sophisticated. When I started with Super Mario, it was 2G, you know? 2G, yeah, 2, 2 deep, 2 deep. Now it's like 3D, 4, 4D, whatever, you know. Yeah, it's, it's very advanced one. But the thing is that the future that you're going to lead is very, very different from what I was passing, right? And it's more digitized world. It's in, so the, now robots have become like a human being, right? Do you think it's a good thing? Why so? Hmm? Mm -hmm. What are those? You might want to use uh, like uh, the life will become easier, uh, but this is also the uh, like uh, people will uh, uh, they can be over you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. At the end of the day, sort of we need to regulate the these robots as well, right? Morality is also the one, you know? Yeah, this also not that attention. Yeah, so... <laughs> we lose job basically, right? We just have to hang around and all that. So, employment is also very important, isn't it? Do you remember the circular flow? Where we get money, so we lose job, then how we can survive this way? Okay, no Coca-Cola. Hmm? No Coca-Cola, no Coca okay. <laughs> Maybe thumbs up is okay? <laughs> right. So the, the future, the way we work will change. The, the way society will um, operate will change. Right? We have to be up powers robots. Can we win over them? They can produce much, much more. Right? Yeah. So in that case, we need to see where we are going to go ahead. But this we call it as industrial revolution. Dharma. I, yesterday I was looking at it, how futuristic isn't this? The driver was uh, started which year? It started 1959. The driver is the, the cat types robot, is it? And they're flying, and this also had this idea from 1969. We probably seen it. This is a coexistence of the human and technology. Okay. I don't know, I'm just thinking about it. I don't know if you have any reflection. When you see Duran, just, just think about it, where your future will be. <laughs> okay. But if we can fly, we can do much, much more than what we are doing, isn't it? So our productivity also changes. Right? And then, but to have this, what do we need? We need the cheaper access to the right? So we need to have more access to Takikokta. Takikokta needs to be cheaper. And it needs to be skilled. It needs to be available in the Kirana store. And that's where businesses need to come in, right? To reduce the cost, have a skill, right? Other thing, sorry, just, just give me a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. More short term future. And right? this is the UN is promoting to have better, inclusive, you know, environmentally concerned society we need to create. This is a target that they are promoting. What is this? E rickshaw. E Riksha is coming from Japan. I do not know. Riksha that we see is a Jin Riksha. Human Jin means human. Human is pulling Riksha. And right? that's Japan. This is Kolkata. Japan is exporting this every year to India. 
Now we have this oh, yes. auto rickshaw. Right? You see the technology changes. Right? We can access to much, much longer <coughs> distance. Right? Here the corroboration, coordination, learning from foreign you know, technology also came in and we have auto rickshaw. But why we need to have this? So, one of the problem is industrial revolution. You saw a lot of coals we burning, right? A lot of fossil fuels we burning. That contributes to the climate change negatively. Climate change, temperature being changing, right? rising very rapidly. Our climate is changing. So, we need to reduce the GHG emissions, right? So, that a lot of attempt has been made to make electrified mobility right? and the public transportation use is also very important in a way right mass transportation use so that we change the behavior before there's a metro you were using all the cars and then you know auto rickshaws and all that right so now we have different type of mode of transportation now we have electrified rickshaw right so there's of course a debate no if the coal is burning to create the uh, generate the electricity, that is also the controversy that's having. But certainly the pollution is much less than before. Less than before, right? That's where we talk a lot about the environmental consequences. Right? We can't talk. Um, we, we can't go ahead with talking about development any longer without talking about sustainability and environment, right? That's where also the business opportunity comes in. Right? We only have this. Eh? Human, pretty much our effort. Now we have some mechanized system. Now we have further having a battery system, battery system to store. So you can also combine with the solar, isn't it? And so those technological advancement is also happening everywhere. So we keep keep going on with the changes. Right? So we need, you, you cannot talk the economy without the economy, this uh, uh, environmental aspect. Do you know that India is hosting G20? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so without me telling you. So that is also very interesting to look at the logo. India is conscious about climate-based approach and right? trying to see the integration. This is fundamentally to talk about economic cooperation, isn't it? G20 is so to talk about the global coordination of the economic policies. But they talk a lot about the environment, they talk a lot about life, you know, a line, a feed, life that is the Prime Minister is promoting, right? How we are going to behave in a way. And also they're talking about the environment. So the center of discussion is the innovation linking with the environment. Elon Musk, you have heard about him. Yes. Okay. What is he doing? Tesla. So he's innovating, right? And he's also, who's, who went to the moon? Is it Elon Musk? Oh, someone else. These rich people. <laughs> but anyway, that's a space is another area. I think India is also having a lot of defense industry coming up and a lot. But anyway, that's putting aside. But environment has become very important. So this is a conclusion. Sorry, I took some more time. But we are talking about social science today, right? Science, but social science. Right? We are trying to, science is more on the natural science part, but we are trying to understand the system, right, from the behavioral aspects as well, and social interactions as well. And where the growth is coming from is industrialization. That is my key message. But we need to have alternative way to develop, isn't it? So that's very important. And technology is, is the driver of the economic growth. See, long cycles, right? short cycles. Right? So it's a technology. And we need to be very agile. And I'm sure you are. But you know, we also need to create the change by ourselves, right? Latin Papa is saying, it's not only the, the crisis period, we need to be always constantly changing. That's I'm telling to myself as well. Yeah? Okay, so that is 
for now, at this moment in time, if you have any questions, I'm happy to say. Ma'am, is mechanization and innovation same or they are dependent on each other? In my view, it's dependent on each other. You see, you need to innovate something. It's not only needing to make something mechanized, but your behavior also can change. Right? Innovate for some other, say, we, we talk about the penicillins. Right? The penicillin, when they were discovered, is not in the maybe the same form as it is. Right? Maybe penicillin, uh, sorry, I'm not the, you know, the chemist or the, I don't know the details, but they must have been diversified. <coughs> Understanding that to be diversified to even something else, to make a chain reactions and all that, right? That's why the biochemical and others are coming in, right? So in a way, that it, innovation is not limited to mechanization, but it's sort of the interlink practice, if I were to answer that. Do, do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as it is good, there are after 10 years or I think the general question is where is the money gone? What happened behind the scenes? How multi uh, multi dollar companies got a uh, 30 to 40 percent loss overnight? Uh, basically, what happened behind the scene? How did this happen? So, yeah, I understand what the problem behind it. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the, the, when we say crisis, there are two types of crisis. One is financial crisis, the other one is an economic crisis. Normally it comes together, sometimes only the financial crisis comes. Yeah. So the, when we say the economic crisis, the near economy suddenly collapses. Production process stops or the decline as it is. Industrial production declines. When it comes to the financial crisis, the payment system experiences a larger effect. Okay? But anyway, no need to sort of get into the gritty of it, but what happens is that many, many companies are dependent on the stock market. Stock market. When a crisis happens, typically stock market crash 40 to 50 percent. Their source of finance is coming from the stock market. As stock market collapses their money, vanishes. Right? Other thing is that if they are doing some investment, right, they invariably borrow money from banks and other right? Then they need to also repay the debt they have. And then banks also are into the big problem. Because no one is repaying the debt, then banks get into trouble, then they request you to repay much faster. But then all the transactions stores because you also get some liability or you know from others and all. Hey, so in that case, all the dependent channels will be disrupted. Your income source will also be disrupted because the consumption will stop, isn't it? With the crisis and all that, people will go bankrupt, then they, they can repay to you as well. So the money disappears in a different different channels, but one way is the stock market that is collapsing at this point. The other one is the real economy get affected, your income source will be stopped, and you cannot actually, you, you have to repay very quickly because they need a short term money to be give it to the, the counterpart this way. Yeah, is it clear? Yeah. Mm. That's what the government has been trying hard. The government is always intervening in the market and the economy to stop. So what we see is a 2007 to 9 crisis after US US has intervened in the market and print a lot of money, just digitally print a lot of money and give it to big firms. So when the, the corporates are in trouble, they supplement it with this a lot of money supply. Okay, but it's not effective. So what happens is after the COVID crisis, if you see what government did, they did the cash transfer to many people. And even in India, have you seen that? People get money. Then MSMEs, the small companies, have gotten some loan you know, difference or they are weighed with the loans and all that, right? So they also use some of these uh, uh, tools, policy tools, to try to stop everyone 
codes. But the effectiveness is very unclear. <coughs> what happens is that now the debt is mounting. I think about the personal finance. You're borrowing a lot to finance something. So you borrow a lot and you try to give it to someone else. You are having a lot of debt. Then your expenditure will be spend a lot on giving back some whatever you borrow. Right. So the debt is increasing. So the consequence is that you don't have space to grow anymore. Then again, crisis will come. So, and then business activity will be stopping, right? So, in that case, this is an endogenous system, we call it system embedding the 7 to 11 years. This disruption needs to come. So, it's very difficult to stop it. If you look at the government, what they've been doing, how effective that is, no matter what they do, 7 to 11 years, crisis has been happening. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Sorry, one or two. Yeah. Uh, one last year, um, in my view, and in my view, and in December 2021, I heard some news about the sewer economy of China. There was a company, there is a company, and it is said that the company uh, is building uh, flats and apartments, but no one is uh, living in those apartments. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, the debt is mounting. So, what is your stance on this that the economy uh, about the economy of China? Secondly, uh, there are allegations of China that uh, they need, they force some you know 14, 15 years uh, children to work so that they won't be grow. So, what are your uh, stances on this? Yeah, okay, thank you. So let me start with the first one, right? So what happens is the bubble is forming. So what happens is in the property sectors, like 2007-9 crisis in the US as well, what happens is that many builders, construction, construction companies have built a huge amount of flats because price has been rising, price has been rising in the property market, so the builder just try to build a lot. Then, but then still what they do is the rich people goes to these apartments and they buy the flat and they don't live, but they lend, okay? But they, the property price is rising. These developers are, are becoming rich, but ordinary people who are going to buy is not having <coughs> enough money. The wages are not rising, okay? So in that case, there's a discrepancy between the rich people and ordinary people, basically. But because the property prices are going, it became a bubble, we call it. Bubble, we call it. Because there is going to be supply and demand balances. Supply is done by the industry, demand is for land. There is no balances, and like you said, the debt is just mounting because they can they cannot recover the investment. Then it bursts at a certain point. Especially we see the interest rate rising. Interest rate is something that if you borrow money, you have to pay. No? That is now increasing, right? So the increasing interest rate also hits because you have to repay more. Them, right? So that is one. Two on child labor. I think child labor issue is a very sensitive issue across the globe. If you look at the uh, industrial revolution in the UK, that time a lot of child labor has been happening. India as well, I think there are many kids working, right? So the kids are basically seen as a workforce. But that is, in my view, should not be happening, having access to the school is very important. But can I just say that that is bad? Because in each household has a, has a strategy to make, isn't it? So, but then in my view, education is very important because it's a long-term investment, right? But some parents may not have enough access to the education. So that's where social safety net, where the policy is coming in to make sure that everyone can be sent to the school. At this moment in time, everything is individual responsibility, isn't it? So that's where the society needs to come to create an environment. You just send the kids to the school and your income also will be guaranteed, which hasn't been happening at this moment in time. So it's, it's very difficult to discuss in a moral, morality perspective and a reality perspective. That, that's my view. Yeah. Okay. So just this one question from the back side. 
for migration is like after the atomic bombing of Japan. What are the steps that Japan take to grow into a, such an enormous economy? And what are they currently doing to boost their economy so much? And why we are lagging that much? Even though we are something, we are having a good balance since the atomic bombing of Japan. Yeah, so what happened is that the economic boom basically comes with work. Unfortunately, I have I, I don't want to say this, but when the, even 1930s, when the US had a depression and it started to grow, the World War II has boosted the US economy to recover. Right? And what happens to Japan is after the war that they need to reconstruct, reconstruct the economy. So that's why a lot of investment has been made to reconstruct the economy. That's where we have the economy miracle once again, to, to restart. But the Japanese society has become matured. Matured in the sense that the, firstly, the economic growth is not as, as fast as before. It's actually stagnating. The population is growing. Corporations are having huge pile of cash, but they're not investing. Because Japanese economy is no longer being seen as a good investment country. A country like India is seen as now very much growing. So the speed of growth is some factors for the corporations to invest. What they did, they went to China first. Because China was that time very cheap labor like, like India used to be. And their of course political side was very difficult, but they made a lot of favorable policies to have a foreign direct investment. And now Chinese Labor cost is very high, a lot of uncertainty has come. The Japanese companies are now moving to Vietnam. But what happens is because Japanese economy becomes very weak and also the exchange rate, sorry, I didn't explain this greatly today, with the differences that Japanese labor become much cheaper relative to before. So the many corporates are trying to come back to Japan to revive the economy, but the problem with the labor shortages, that is the problem. That's why you see the Japan is now going to be, continue to be declining. That's why the government came in to try to save everyone, but individual wages, my wages are not rising in Japan. So we basically become impoverished. We are in the third biggest economy in the world. Relatively, we are becoming poor. So in that case, the Japanese economy is trying to keep it up, but not the spectacular growth that we are going to see. Like India is going to see. So, see in five, ten years' time where India will be. And the growing relations of Japan with China are still a threat to India? It's, sorry? The growing relations of Japan with China. The growing relation of Japan with China, like moreover, they are having a lot of exports from China and imports. The trade relations are too much with China than India. And also, Japan has an advantage of being on the East, uh, East China Sea. And the exclusive economic zone of Japan lies in some part of the Chinese territory. That is the same case what happens in the South China Sea. So, is it a, like, a potential threat to India? Because India and India is not having good relations with China. In the past few years, we have seen that we have a lot of conflicts with China. So, do you take it as a threat or what can be done? Um, you see, the politically looking, it's very difficult. Any country that is having uh, any political relationship with China is very, very difficult for Japan, for India, for any other country, especially that now we are having this uh, quad coordination system, right? So the US, uh, India, Australia, and Japan. Japan. Yeah, they're also having so the security discussions and things going on. Also, you know, semiconductors and all that. Right? But anyway, the point is that we need to separate political from the economic understanding. If you look at it, how much import India make from China? That is huge. China is the second largest trade part trading partner for India at this moment in time. So whether you like it or not, the dependency on the economic term is there. Until unless India becomes self-sufficient to be able to develop whatever you are importing, dependency on China will continue. Like Japan also has been continuing to have a dependencies. So in that case, 
Economically, of course, it's a threat. You, do, you don't have independence. But can we survive without China at this moment in time? No, because world manufacturing hub is in China. That's where the, the Germany is also trying to reindustrialize and accelerate much of the industrialization. US is also saying the reindustrialization. Japan is also trying to reindustrialize back workforce in, in Japan. So some reversal is happening. Can I answer you questions? Uh, my question is, is there any example of economic crisis uh, impacting the technology in the hmm. Technology, but I, I don't have concrete, you know, um, example, but think about the recent crisis. You know, what happens is that we change the way we work. You started the online classes, probably. That is one thing that the technology has changed the way we Communicate. We have more digitized and we have more access and all that. And then infrastructure ramp up. Why the traditional sector like uh, tourism, right? The when human interaction is needed, it collapses completely. Mm -hmm. So, and but they also have been introducing some virtual uh, tours and all that, right? So these also they try to innovate to have make a different type of services to create. So in that case, um, each uh, crisis has a different reactions, but this time I think we'll see a lot of divisions in the new technology, which is in the education and also the IT sector. But interestingly, the US IT companies are firing everyone that's impacting on India as well, right? So that some changes also coming in the IT sector. And then there was one more question, like, uh, like what is the importance of the way people work? I mean, basically there's more towards the process innovation question. I mean, especially after the, uh, the crisis in the Japan, I mean, the way they work, like what is the importance of it? Should we do it? So what, what, what? Uh, the, way, the way people work, like the process innovation that we talked about, yeah. right? I mean, what is the importance of that in, in rebuilding any kind of effective economy? So, basically, in my view, maybe I'm, I'm not answering your question directly, but we are, we, so fundamentally, we are wage labor. We need to live, and then for that, we need to give our labor to some places where we affiliate with us. So, in my case, I'm getting the wages from the university, right? So, the other people also work in the corporates and all that. How we work? Is the different phenomena, different uh, um, processes we can see. Japanese, we have been having a lot of uh, suicide because we are overworking. That is from the peer pressures, societal pressures. But I hear US also people work a lot, but European people are just having two months breaks in between their age of life. Eh? But productivity, what is the output? Is always a question. Do you have to keep working like a hamster all the time, or you can have a break? What is the output? That is always the discussion. But when it comes to the reconstruction, like like even we had a huge tsunami as well. The Japanese people are very diligent and have a judgment and also to rebuild is something that you want to bring back where what that was. So in that case. I think also the emotional part of it, and also the national characters and the societal <coughs> values. So I think that we need to go back to the value system discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, if we consider all the relations between consumers and producers, or even between economics, uh, the system uh, we will consider. Yeah, is it going to be controlled by some individuals, some really rich individuals, and uh, and they can let the consumers to consume what they want to them? That's a very fundamental question, actually, whether individual impacts or the system impacts. Like, if you consider the all other things, like I'm buying something, mm. <coughs> that's where then they must be a person who is controlling all the money and. It should be superior. So, who could be playing behind the scene? How would you do that? Mm. I, I think I know what you are trying to <laughs> attempt, but if I just talk about the business transactions, it is a marketing. Yeah. 
It is a marketing, right? Mm -hmm. How we change the behavior. Yeah. Why do we buy Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola creates a huge mm -hmm. image, you know, very mm -hmm. heart heartwarming, touching images in advertisement, mm -hmm. right? Other uh, Tata, Tata tea. It's very emotional, isn't it? Right? So they create the brand images to influence your preferences. That is something that the business strategy has been doing to expand the demand for goods. Yes, I am talking about that uh, deep in the people's Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but they yeah. want us to consume what they want actually. If they, they will introduce something and uh, they uh, like they will introduce that in a way that we really like that, then we will consume it and then they will get even more rich. So in that sense, of course, marketing is one. The other one is also like a flavor, changing the flavor, right? That's a taste. You become addicted. Right? Internet is also something that you get. Yeah. That is happening with a global system. Yeah. Then some people say it's a conspiracy, but there is a certain way that we become a bit like sheep following on one side. That's the danger of the technology as well, isn't it? That's why now you need to stand up what is your value. Again, I think you need to come back to the value system. See, whoever is influencing, if your value is very clear, then you can stand up, isn't it? But consciously, unconsciously, we are influenced by the surroundings. That's why you need to understand the economic, social relationship and all sorts of different you know, social science subject to supplement that. I think what you're saying is a very fundamental thing. Thank you. I'm sure all of you have enjoyed it thoroughly. Please give her a big round. So, thank you everyone for the patient hearing uh, lots of interesting questions you asked just to pick your curiosity at the end and to check how much you have learned. So, if you are working from home versus working in offices, which do you think would lead to more economic activities? Offices, right? So, the last question that he asked, the way we work. This is just one example. So I'm sure you have had your learnings in this particular session, how science, technology, innovation, businesses, they are all interrelated and how they need to develop it, right? But one last one last thing before you leave this all, uh, the session uh, would not have been possible without the efforts of Mr. Gaurav who is standing here and please give him Have the person behind you who is recording the session for future reference. Thank you. And our audio visual, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Okay, so uh, he is the person who is taking care of the audio visual um, structure that you see in this room infrastructure, right? So please do that. Organizer Professor Bishwajit. Thank you. Thank you. So, the refreshment is outside. Before you grab your refreshment, we want to grab your picture. Uh, okay, so time for group picture outside this one. Uh, and if we can add it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.